here to share his experiences in his fourth visit to NIST. Please welcome Shea Rhodes. So this is your fourth time visiting NIST in eight years. What brought you to NIST in the first place and what brings you back so regularly? The first time I came was because uh, an ex-teacher now, uh, Simon Schoons, invited me. Um, it was really that simple. He saw a film that I made in southern Thailand and he got in touch with me on Facebook and said, would you be interested in coming to speak to some of my students? I thought the guy was crazy, to be honest. I was like, who, who is this dude and, and what, has he just come out of nowhere on Facebook? But, you know, we carried on. We had a little chat. I did my research and <laughs> checked, checked that he is who he said he was. And I was quite interested in the idea. For me, I get to make documentaries and it's, in, it's an incredible privilege. But after those few months are over and the half hour documentary has been made, sometimes it can be quite disappointing because it gets broadcast and then that's kind of it. You might get some tweets, you might get some Facebook comments, occasionally you'll get an email from someone, but that's it. You don't really get to engage with people on it. Even when people stop me in the street and like, say, hey, I saw your documentary, it's like, cool, you have a little chat, but you're in the middle of the street, you know, I'm, I've got my kids, I'm going shopping, they're, they're on their way somewhere else. So coming here and being able to actually share it with you guys, tell you a little bit more about it, some of the things that didn't make it onto the actual documentary, some of the things that happened behind the scenes, um, and to answer your questions is really rewarding for me. In your 12 years as a journalist, you've been all around the world, Bolivia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, everywhere we can imagine. Out of all your excursions, I saw that one of the episodes you shot took place in Thailand. Could you tell us a little bit about the story? So I first came to southern Thailand. That was the first unreported world documentary I ever made, actually. So it was a really big deal for me. Um, I came here to cover the insurgency in the southern, in south of Thailand. Uh, at the time, the terrorist groups had turned their attention to attacking teachers. They saw teachers as representatives of the Thai state and, and, and Buddhism, uh, and they wanted to try and get back at the Thai government somehow. And so they started attacking teachers on their way to school. Teachers were getting shot. A couple got blown up in their cars on the way to school. And I found that from the other side of the world when I read about it. I just found that shocking. And I really wanted to come out and, uh, and find out where it all started from and why it's going on. This leads me to my next question. We often see service initiatives by high school students in pursuit of betterment of the societies around them. How do you think that we, either as a school or as youth leaders, can contribute towards effectively addressing the volatile issues that you often report on? A lot of the time, I think the most important thing is to break issues down. Uh, when you look at an issue, sometimes they can be huge. Uh, they can involve so many different people, corporations, uh, and, and details that can be mind-blowing. But sometimes when you break things right down, you can see that actually there's some pretty simple solutions. So if I take the example of Bolivia and the children who work in the mines out there, it's bad that children work in mines, uh, but at the end of the day, those mines exist purely because of our demand for metals. So if we can get involved in recycling more, for instance, and there's less demand for newly mined materials, and then theoretically at least, there's less of a market for those kids to end up having to go down the mines in the first place or for anyone to need to. So you've got to kind of break things down and also it's important to not feel too guilty. Sometimes issues are terrible and things are going on around the world that are really bad, but your guilt isn't going to help. Sometimes just looking at your own life and trying to live a life that is a positive example, trying to do things that you know are good, whether it be recycling, donating your time to voluntarily to, to charitable purposes and so on. You keep doing things that you know are good and eventually good will come from it. Speaking of the issues of today, I'd like to ask you a little bit about global issues in context of your career. In light of the current political climate in Western nations, the distrust of mainstream media has grown exponentially. From this growth, growing mindset of skepticism to the advent of the so-called fake news networks, how has the recent events impacted your work as a journalist? My work's been impacted hugely. Um, and to be honest, this started way before this year. For, for us, uh, in my profession, I think it kind of started with reality TV. It, it's one of the, the things, I mean, listen, everybody loves watching reality TV and it's, it's gone all around the world. But what made things really difficult for me as a documentary maker and a storyteller is that it then made my stories somehow seem less spectacular 
because you've got this reality which is often completely fake which always looks a lot more shocking or a lot more interesting and then there was this assumption from people who've been fed this diet of constant reality TV there's an, an assumption that what I do is done the same way when it's just completely not so we've already been challenged hugely by that and we've sometimes risen to that challenge sometimes frankly we've got it completely wrong leading up to this point now this year where suddenly I say suddenly where yeah it's pretty sudden this distrust of mainstream media uh, the term itself I think I'd never really heard used before last year and then suddenly there's this mainstream media and I keep thinking what is mainstream me am I mainstream media is that who's who's who are these people it's gonna give us a lot of challenges going forward I think the the most difficult one is to win back people's trust um, and I think the only way we can do that is by returning to basic principles, which is truth, honesty, uh, fact-checking, making sure everything's legal, making sure everything's above board. And if we keep on doing what our journalist code tells us to do, I hope that eventually we can win back the trust. Fake news is a great example of why I believe we will eventually win back the trust. When people stop trusting the mainstream media, they decide that instead of reading an article and looking for a name like Washington Post, New York Times, or something that they recognize, they simply read an article and take it on face value, then they're, they're likely to end up victims of fake news websites. A few embarrassing posts from people going, oh my god, look what's happened, and it turns out to be fake. Trust me, they'll come back to the mainstream <laughs> media, because nobody wants to be the idiot who sent out the fake news, fake news post, right? It seems as though a big part of the issues that you report on is the lack of education throughout the world. With regards to this, how do you think that your educational experiences have shaped your outlook? Well, I went to a, a private school which was very much like NIST, actually. Um, hey, the facilities weren't as good, maybe the teachers weren't as good, but we had a lot of attention. We had some very small class sizes. We were given that sense that what we thought was important and we were given plenty of opportunities to put our opinions forward and to present our side of things and we were respected in that, re in that way. And I think I see the same going on here at NIST. Um, I met you two years ago, you're already a better person than you were then, <laughs> you know? Thank you. And it, it happens all the time, every time I come back here I meet kids who have grown, who have, who have changed, who have evolved and who have become sometimes scarily, you know, amazing people, people who I go, wow, when you get out in the real world, I would employ you. <laughs> and that's really rewarding to know that I had a tiny part in that. I love that, and it's the reason I keep coming back. So thank you for coming here again. Uh, I just have one last question. Do you happen to have any words of advice for helping us become more active and impactful individuals in our local and global communities? I think one of the biggest things that I've learned this year is that we all need to be engaging with as many different people as we possibly can. Now for years we've told ourselves that we're doing that, but I think the election of Donald Trump in America and Britain deciding to leave the EU and whatever the next future political shock is, proves to us that we don't necessarily know all the people in our country. We don't necessarily respect all the different opinions. And I certainly never understood how many people held some opinions which I find quite unsavory. Perhaps if I'd been out engaging with those people on a more regular basis, it wouldn't have happened. And I think we all need to take that on board. There are people in Thai society living here in Bangkok who you have no interaction with, I'm certain of that. You need to find ways to interact with them, to find out their perspective. And when they hear your perspective and you hear theirs, automatically the two of you will align and there'll be less shocks going forward. Thank you again for coming and we look forward to your next visit. Cool. Thanks, man. Thank you.